Well, welcome to your new online church platform. My name's Daniel, and I'll be your host this morning. This site will allow us to stream our Sunday morning services, but to do it in a way where we actually have some connection and some interaction during the service. Now, later today, we'll post on our various sites like YouTube, Vimeo, Facebook, where a lot of people are used to viewing our content, and that's all well and good. But this platform will allow us to do some really cool things where we get to interact and we are all a part of this worship experience. So before we go any further, let me give you a tour so you know what to expect. Now it might be hidden behind a bar in the top with three horizontal lines, but click on that and you will see some important information like give. This will link out to our secure giving platform where you can not only give to the general fund that allows us to, to pay the bills and do the things that we need to as a church, but also a special designated fund titled Love Nova. We want to be a blessing to those in Northern Virginia, and this is our way that anything that goes into this fund is going to be distributed to our local residents and our local church family in need. We are so thankful for your partnership, allowing us to be able to serve our community in that way. You'll also see a section titled Connection Card. Just like we normally do on Sunday morning the, in the seat back in front of you, we have a digital connection card where you can communicate with us and let us know if you're new or if you made a decision or want to be involved in any particular way. You'll also see links to our social media, our Facebook, and our new Instagram. So make sure you follow that so you can stay up to date to all the most current information. Now chat is a very important feature on this platform. This chat is public, so please be careful what you say. This allows us to be able to hear from you and get feedback. Let us know where you're watching from. Let us know who you're with. We'd love to be able to interact with you that way. We'll also have some hosts there to be able to lead that discussion and that interaction, some staff members and some prayer team members. You'll also see a section titled Notes. Now that's gonna be an important section for sermon notes and any important information that we wanna share. There's hyperlinks in there that will link out directly to some of the things that we bring up on a Sunday morning. Now we'll embed a lot of scripture into the video throughout the morning as we go, but you also have the whole Bible at your fingertips here. Now the default is King James Version, so it's Old English, it's not the most user-friendly in the world. Now I would recommend changing that from the King James Version to the NIV, the New International Version, or the NLT, New Living Translation. It's gonna be a little bit more reader-friendly in our common language that we would use today. You'll also see a section that says Request Prayer. Some of our staff and prayer team members are available to be able to uh, connect with you in that way. That will launch into a private chat just between the two of you. Now this is a live person, so I know it's interesting and you're curious about it. Please don't overwhelm the staff, especially at the beginning, uh, just to see if the feature works. It does work. If you need prayer, request prayer and we will be there for you. Now we need to give credit where credit is due. And I wanna give a big shout out to life.church that is based out of Oklahoma City that made this platform available for free. This is America's biggest church. They have 35 campuses currently, and God has just blessed them in incredible, unique ways. And so we are thankful for them and their partnership to the kingdom to make things like this platform available. Also the Bible app that you probably have on your phone. They made that, released it for free for the public and has just been a huge blessing to so many people around the world. So thank you, Pastor Craig Rochelle. Thank you, Life Church, uh, for your generosity and making things like this possible. So that should be it. That's our tour of our new online church platform. And we are so excited to be able to bring this tool to you so that we can interact and we can have church together and we can help everyone take their next steps with Jesus. Now, before Pastor Chad comes and brings a message, 
going to throw it over to Gary, and he and his worship team are going to lead us in a couple songs. Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in. Boy, it's crazy out there, right? There's so much uncertainty, there's so much fear going around, but uh, we just want to remind you guys that no matter what happens, it doesn't change who God is, it doesn't change what God is worth. He's got everything under control. Now more than ever, we need to be the kind of people that really trust him. You know, when things happen, uh, we have to make a decision. Do we really believe all this stuff or not? So hopefully as we sing these songs, uh, you will be encouraged, you'll be inspired to just put your faith in God. We're going to sing a song about God's sovereignty. It's called The Lion and the Lamb. If you know it, please sing along. Let's do it. Two, three, four. Take it from the top. He's coming. Oh, he's coming through the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. Whoa, every chain will break. Has broken hearts declare his praise. Oh, who could stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the lion, the lion. the 
So let's just continue with our time of worship. This is King of My Heart. Two, three, four. Let the King. Let the King of My Heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are good. You're good. Gary. Now, before Chad comes and preaches, I just want to pause and say thank you. Thank you for your generosity. As a church, you have done an amazing job in allowing us to continue the work that we're doing, even though we can't meet in our physical location on Sunday mornings. So thank you for those that are already giving online. Thank you for those of you that are giving sacrificially. We know that the upcoming days, weeks, months are, are, are going to test us and people are going to be stretched thin. And that's why we've launched our Love Nova initiative. We want to be a blessing to Northern Virginia. And as the rest of the world is out there making runs in the grocery stores and hoarding all of the toilet paper, you have just given sacrificially. And so thank you for those that came to help receive donations. Thank you for those of you that did our curbside drop off to be able to give to this initiative. We are so excited about what God is going to do with the faithful generosity that our church has displayed and the ways that we're going to be able to love Northern Virginia in the upcoming season. So you can learn more about ways you can get involved at our website. And we'd love for you to be a part of what God's doing here in Northern Virginia. 
Now, we are going to go to Chad, and he is going to deliver a, a message for us this morning. So, Chad, here's to you. I want to go back to our seven-day series because it fits so well for us right now. In fact, I want to take us back to 1980, which was 40 years ago. It was the 1980 Winter Olympics that took place in Lake Placid, New York. The semifinals of Olympic hockey was the ultimate battle at the time, the United States versus Russia. For those who remember, this was the middle of the Cold War. The United States and Russia were not friends. The Russian team was the powerhouse at the time. Uh, the Soviet team had won four consecutive gold medals. And in 1980, they were expected to win again. And their, their team was made up of basically Washington Capitol players like Ovechkin. I mean, they were all professional hockey players. The U.S. team, on the other hand, was made up of a bunch of college hockey players, a bunch of amateurs. Well, in the days leading up to the Olympics, the U.S. team lost 10 to 3 to Russia. They were given no chance to win. In fact, the odds were about 1,000 to 1 that the U.S. would lose. If you're familiar with the story, you know that that scrappy group of college kids defeated the Russians 4-3. to three. That win became known as the miracle on ice. The U.S. team went on to defeat Finland 4-2 to two to win the gold medal. Now, I can imagine that all the U.S. team heard going into the semifinals was, you'll never win. You're not good enough. They are going to crush you. Yet with insurmountable odds in front of them, they still won. You know, we love stories like this one. The first one, the person no one believed in takes the victory. The team no one thought could win comes out on top. It's those David and Goliath moments. We, we love reliving these stories and, and seeing them take place today, or I should probably say in the future now. But here we are today, and I mean, let's, let's be honest. On the one hand, humanity seems to be facing insurmountable odds against this virus. It is affecting so much of our lives. We're working from home. We're stuck at home. We're stuck at home with our kids, right? But I also know some of you that are watching today, you're facing personal obstacles. There is something so big in front of you, you're not sure how to get beyond it. You don't know what to do. Maybe there are even people who are whispering in your ear, hey, there's no way you're going to make it out of this. Now, for you, it could be medical. Maybe it's some sickness, some disease. Maybe it is this virus. It could be emotional, depression, anxiety, fear. It could be in your relationships, your marriage, your kids, your family, your friends. I mean, right now, it could be work or the lack of it, possible unemployment. It could be financial. It could be your debts, your loans, a possible recession that's on its way. But right now, all you see is this big obstacle in front of you. We're going to call this a mountain. And you're wondering, how do I get beyond this? You, you know where you want to go. You, you know where you want to be. But how, how do I get there? How, how do I get over this mountain that's sitting in front of me? How do I get beyond this mountain that is blocking my path? Today, I want to look at an event that takes place in the last seven days of Jesus's life that I find is helpful when it comes to those times in life when the odds seem insurmountable. In Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 14, we find Jesus is right before he goes into the temple to tear it apart. And we, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Jesus at this moment is hangry, right? You know what hangry is. You're so hungry, you're angry. And so Jesus is angry and he sees this fig tree, which doesn't have any figs on it. And so he tells the fig tree, die, fig tree, die. Now, it isn't actually the time for figs anyway. So that response by Jesus is a bit strange. So whatever, they, they head into Jerusalem and Jesus goes in, he clears the temple and they go back home. But then I want you to look at Mark chapter 11, verses 20 through 21. Here's what we see happens next. Look at verse 20. It says, the next morning as they passed by the fig tree he had cursed, the disciples noticed it had withered from the roots up. Peter remembered what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day and exclaimed, look, Rabbi, 
The fig tree you cursed has withered and died. It's the next morning, and Jesus and his posse are passing this same fig tree, and it's dead. Now remember, this isn't the season for figs, but Jesus curses it anyway. The question is why? Scholars say Jesus knew it wasn't the time for figs. What he was really doing was using the fig tree as a parable. Now, a parable is a story that teaches a lesson. So the fig tree represented the temple and the religious leaders. They kept promising fruit from their work as religious leaders. Yes, we're going to help people meet God. Yes, we're going to help people connect to God. What was actually happening was no fruit was being produced at all. They were just like the dead fig tree except their death was in their souls. It's funny because the disciples actually don't respond to the parable. They respond to the deadness of the tree. They can't believe what Jesus said came true. He said, die, fig tree, die. And there it was. The next day, the tree was dead. See, they saw this incredible power in Jesus' words. And here's what Jesus shares with them in Mark chapter 11, starting with verse 22. It says, Then Jesus said to the disciples, Have faith in God. I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it'll happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it'll be yours. I remember as a kid hearing this teaching and wondering, why doesn't this actually happen? I mean, I keep praying my brothers will go away, yet they're still here. Well, Jesus' point of this teaching was not literal. He was being figurative. The teaching wasn't about moving a physical mountain. He was really asking his disciples an important question. How are you praying? How are you praying? Are, are you praying so bold that the mountains in front of you will be begin to disappear? Or are you so stuck in the valley that you don't know what to do next? I believe that is the question for us today. How are you praying? As we look at this teaching, I see two questions we have to answer about our own prayer lives. Question number one is, are your prayers ritualistic or are they expectant? For the Jewish people, the majority of their prayer life was ritualistic. There was one prayer they prayed every single day. It was called the Amidah prayer. This one prayer really had 18 different blessings within it. And so every day, Three times a day, in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, you would stand up and you would put your feet together to keep your foundation firm so you could focus on God. And this prayer was all about reciting the same words over and over and over again. This was the focal prayer for the Jewish people. Now, some of us, we, we grew up in churches like that, right? Where we said the same prayers over and over and over again. And now I could start one of those prayers right now and you could finish it. Even if you haven't read it or heard it in 20 years. Here's my question. Is there any depth to it? Is there any faith behind it? Now, please know I'm not saying that reciting prayers is bad or wrong. There are good, healthy prayers we recite that may keep us focused on God But the problem can be they become ritualistic. A better question for us to answer is, are our prayers expectant? A couple of weeks ago, Kara was running behind to pick up Jake from school, and she got home from work, ran inside the house, grabbed the dog, and took off to the school to pick Jake up. Well, halfway to the school, she realized something. I don't have any doggy bags. So she thought, do I turn around and go back home? Well, she decided she didn't have the time to do that, to pick up Jake. So she said, she prayed. Her prayer was this, said, God, if you could help out, I need a doggy bag for the dog just in case he has to poop. 
Now, if I made the right decision, God, here's what I need you to do. To help me pick up Jake on time, and because I didn't grab those bags, let there be an unused doggy bag sitting around that I could pick up and use. Kara says she finished praying, turned the corner, and sure enough, lying there bright, colorful, and unused was a doggy bag. Wish she didn't end up needing it anyway, but that's beside the point, okay? Now, I told her if this had been me, the story would have been so much different. My, my prayer would have been the same as hers. Hey, hey God, if you could provide a, an unused doggy bag, that would be great. Then here's what would have happened. No bag would have been there around that corner. And, and then our dog would have stopped in front of the one house where the owners were outside. Watching. Waiting. And our dog would have done his business and I would have had to grab the poop in my hand and probably stuff it into my pants pockets. That would have happened to me. Well, as Kara was telling the story, she said, I don't think I'd cared about the bag, but I thought, well, why not pray about it? Uh, okay, so I'm not, I'm not saying your expectant prayers should be about doggy bags, all right? But I wonder, do we pray expecting God to answer those prayers? prayers? Are your prayers rituals lacking faith or are they expectant, ready for God to answer them? Which now leads us to the second question. Are your prayers fearful or are they bold? As Jesus is teaching, he throws out the imagery of this mountain, right? This mountain we can move. Well, the mountain was actually a common word picture of that day for rabbis. When rabbis were discussing a topic, if one rabbi helped another rabbi understand a teaching that they couldn't fully comprehend before, then they would say he, you know, that rabbi just moved a mountain. Jesus is asking his disciples, what mountain is in front of you? What difficulties lie ahead of you? What insurmountable odds are coming soon? Are you praying boldly? about them. My guess is for many of us right now, our hearts and our prayers are full of fear. We pray scared. Scared prayers are not bad prayers, but we pray them due to that fear. What if we prayed expecting God to work and praying out of boldness instead of fear? I know in uncertain times, fear is normal. We went to the grocery store twice this week. One day it was no eggs, no milk, no meat, no fruits, no vegetables. Another day we went and there were eggs, but there was no milk and no meat and no fruits and no vegetables. And both days, of course, there was no toilet paper at all. Now, maybe the silver lining, though, in all of this is that if you look down the chip aisle, there are lots and lots of chips. Maybe we're eating pretty healthy right now. I don't know. It could be that right now is the time that you and I are praying fearful prayers, though. I wonder what would happen if we started praying bold prayers. Mark Battison is the pastor of National Community Church in D.C. A few years ago, he wrote a book called The Circle Maker, and it was all about prayer. In this book, he references the Book of Legends, which is a Jewish compilation of different stories and legends. The main story that Batterson focuses on in his book is the legend of Hani. Hani lived during what is called the silent years. And the silent years fall between the time of the Old Testament writings and the retelling of the life of Jesus in the New Testament. Now, this time frame is between these two times or between the New Testament and Old, time, or Old Testament are 400 years. So for 400 years, all there is, is silence. Nothing from God. Nothing from the prophets, no miracles. Everyone wondered where God was in all this. There's a strout that had overtaken the land and Hani shows up. Hani's an eccentric sage who lives on the outskirts of Jerusalem. And one day Hani walks into town, takes his six foot staff and he begins to draw this large circle around himself. But when he finishes drawing his circle, Hani drops to his knees. He raises his hands to heaven and he prays. Lord of the universe, I swear before your great name that I will not move from this circle until you have shown mercy upon your children. The people are standing around watching and wondering why this strange man 
had drawn the circle and started praying. Then something happened. Raindrops started falling to the, the ground. Now, and at first they were just sprinkles. And as the sprinkles fell, the crowd began to cheer. Honey wasn't done. He kept praying. Not for such rain have I prayed, but for rain that will fill cisterns, pits, and caverns. So those sprinkles turned into this just torrential downpour. And witnesses said that the drops were egg-sized. In fact, it was raining so hard that flash flooding occurred. So the people, they all, they all ran for cover. But not Hani. He stayed and he prayed some more. Here's his prayer. He says, not for such rain have I prayed, but for rain of your favor, blessing, and graciousness. After he prayed, the rain started to let up. And now the rain was more calm and more peaceful. Batterson writes, each raindrop was a tangible token of God's grace. And they didn't just soak the skin, they soaked the spirit with faith. The legend goes that once this happened, Hani finished praying and got up from the ground, left his circle and went back to his normal life again. See, Hani didn't pray out of some ritualistic prayer that he had memorized. He prayed expectantly. He prayed expecting God to answer. He prayed boldly. God had been silent. God had been quiet, but he prayed boldly, expecting God to bless them with rain. And God did just that. Are your prayers expectant? Are your prayers bold? I'm sure right now, all of us have some big mountain in front of us. What is that mountain for you and how big is it? That mountain is probably your fear. The fear of financial instability right now, the fear of contracting this, this virus. Maybe your mountain is your marriage or some other relationship. Maybe your mountain is the unknown future. Maybe it is the anxiety you feel so deep down inside. That mountain's in front of you. It's in front of us, and it's big. It's an obstacle. It might seem difficult to get beyond it. It might be blocking our path, but Jesus says, look beyond this mountain when you pray. Pray expecting God to act. Pray bold prayers that only God can answer. So how are you praying? Since our mountains right now are big, how big are your prayers? I mean, Jesus has challenged us, his disciples and us to pray some bold prayers, but, but why? Because God is asking us this question, how much do you trust me? What do you think I am truly capable of? Because so often our self-reliance, our egos, and our fear get in the way of our bold prayers. So how big and bold are your prayers? Which leads to one last question. How big is your God? For many of us, our God is small. So, so small we can pack our God in a shoebox, right? You know, God, stay in here until I, I need you. And then when we feel we need that tiny, small God, we open that box, we pull God out, and we use God in that moment. Then we finish, we, we grab God, and we put God back into the box, and we close the lid until next time. We treat God like God is our lucky rabbit's foot, only be to use to ward off bad luck. So how big is your God? Listen to what God tells Isaiah in Isaiah 55, 9. He says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Let's think about that bigness of God in and, and this way. Let's Let's look for a moment at science. The sun is 93 million miles from Earth at its furthest distance. If you were to jump in a car and you were to drive at the suggested speed limit of 65 miles per hour, which I know would be tough for some of you, and you were to drive for 24 hours a day, which means you could say to the kids, hey kids, we're not stopping to pee. And then you drove 365 days a year. It would take you 100, in 63 years to get to the sun. 
As most of us know, the sun is part of the Milky Way. The Milky Way is just one galaxy. Right now, we are sure there are about 100 billion galaxies out there. That means, if my math is correct, there are about 13 galaxies per person on Earth right now. In one minute, light travels 11 million miles. In one day, light travels 160 billion miles. In one year, light travels 5 trillion, 865 billion, 696 million miles. Astrophysicists say the edge of the Milky Way is 25 billion light years away. I like to think this is how, how big our God is. If God create something so huge, so expansive, then I think God can handle our expectant and bold prayers. How big are the mountains in front of you right now? Because I know we all have this one mountain in front of us today. And I think God says, I don't care if your mountains are 25 billion light years big. I got you covered. Jesus tells his disciples and us, our prayers are not to be just something we do. They need to be prayers where we expect God to work. That, that our prayers are not to be prayers of fear, but prayers that are bold because our God is big. But those prayers have to come from a place of trust, of trust in God. Last week, we read Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Here, Paul writes to the church there in Philippi. He writes these words to them. In verse 6, he says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Sometimes, maybe many times, our prayers are weak. They lack passion. They lack faith. They lack trust. They're full of fear. And those mountains in front of us, they're still there. They're not moving. So how about you and I start to move some mountains? I want to give us two practical steps today as we that we do or can do together moving forward. Now, the first next step is to go back to that version app that we talked about last week. And I hope you read through the Anxious for Nothing plan. It was really, really good and much needed for me. Well, this time, I want you to go back and I want you to search for the Bold Prayers Reading Plan. And starting today, let's read that together and see what God has in store for us through that reading over the next week. The second next step is an invite. I invite you to grab your phone and set a daily alarm for 11.24 a.m. This will be our reminder about what Jesus said in Mark 11.24, that when we pray expectantly and bold, God hears our prayers. What if all of us are praying those kind of prayers together? Mindset ready to go. In fact, when mine goes off, you two's beautiful day will be pumping at that time for me. When you pick your song, but... As a reminder, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that, you're, that you've received it, it will be yours. So jump in as we pray together. Let me leave you with this. Pray expectantly. Pray boldly. And let's see God move those mountains. Let's pray. And God, right now, we pray expectantly. And we pray boldly for you to work in incredible ways. And our prayer right now, God, is first that you would you'd protect us and you would take care of us in this uh, these uncertain times. This is a, a scary time to pray. This can be uh, a, a fearful time for us to pray, God. But we pray expectantly and we pray boldly that you're going to do amazing things because you are God. <laughs> you have created all of this that we're a part of and and God, however big this bigness is around us, that's how much you love us. That's how much you care for us. And it doesn't matter how big that mountain is, you have us covered. And so we pray that right now, God. I pray for those relationships. I pray for those marriages that are struggling. I pray for um, those finances that are struggling right now and the uncertainty of the future ahead, God. But here's what I pray. I pray that we would believe that you're going to take care of us because you tell us you will. 
I believe that you will watch over us and you will give us what we need. And, and so, God, we lift that prayer up to you right now, that we would have the faith and trust in you to continue to pray those expectant and bold prayers. And that you will hear them, you will listen to them, and you will help answer them for us because you are God. And so right now, God, we pray that you will move those mountains. In Jesus' name, amen. Daniel is now going to lead us in our time of communion. The events of this last week remind me of a time that the disciples were stuck inside behind closed doors. You see, Jesus, their rabbi, the guy they had spent the last three years with, preaching to the masses, healing the sick and the lame, confronting the religious authority, uh, doing these amazing things, instilling hope to the whole countryside. Uh, all of a sudden, Jesus is gone. He was arrested. He was turned over to the Roman authorities, and he was crucified, a criminal's death. And for good reason, they're scared. I mean, they could be next for all they know. And so John chapter 20 tells us the story. Starting in verse 19, it says, On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his sides. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. The disciples were scared. And then Jesus shows up. I mean, literally shows up in the room when the doors were locked. Wow, what a scene. And suddenly the disciples realize that they're not alone. Suddenly, they realize that their rabbi hasn't left them. Suddenly, they realize that he is there. He is with them. And Jesus gives them his spirit, and he gives them a purpose. And that same thing is true for you and me. In verse 21, it says, And again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. If we jump down to the end of this chapter, we see the whole purpose of John writing his gospel, writing his story about Jesus. And his purpose for writing, I think, fits for you and I today. It says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. We take communion together with whatever elements you may have. And we do this in remembrance of Jesus. As he commanded us, do this whenever you gather, however you gather, do this in remembrance of me. So together, we remember his body that was broken for us. And together, we remember his blood that was shed for us, that forgives us of our sins. Let's pray together. God, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for giving us your spirit and allowing us to meet together in this way, in spirit and in truth. God, we praise you for the advancements of technology that allow us to be able to uh, bring this message of hope to the whole world. God, I pray that you would be with us, be with our fear, be with our anxiety that we may carry. God, I pray that we would pray to you. I pray that we would submit 
those desires of our heart before you. Would you check our motives? Would you allow us to do amazing things for you? Would you allow us to love those around us in powerful and unique ways? God, we need you. We need you more than ever. And I pray that the church can be there for our community. I pray that you would give us vision. You would give us inspiration. God, would you give us creativity in how we serve others around you during this time? Father, we pray for protection. We pray for wisdom right now. We know that you are bigger than anything that is going on. And we know that you have a hope, you have a plan, and you have a purpose for our lives. Thank you for this opportunity to gather together as your church. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you so much for being a part of our live stream this morning. The chat will stay open for 10 more minutes at the conclusion of this service. So if you do have prayer requests, please uh, seek that out and hit request prayer so that we can have someone pray with you. Please let us know how this was for you. What was the experience like? We'd love to get your feedback on that. Feel free to put that on the, the public chat there as well. And this week, please stay connected. Our social media, our website is gonna have the most updated information. If you're a part of a serving team or you're a part of a a life group here at The Journey, man, make that be your, your sense of connection. Would you reach out to those people on those teams? Would you see how other people are doing? Would you check in? And let's show the world how we care for one another during this time. Don't forget to love Nova. Figure out creative ways to care for your community, care for your neighbors. Check out our website and so you can join us in what we're doing, but also share your ideas on what that means and how you are able to thoughtfully care for those around you during this time. In the notes section, you can see the two Bible plans that Chad mentioned, so be sure to check that out. And finally, thanks for being here. Thanks for being a part of this live stream service. And we would love to see you next week at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. Take care. See ya.